Hi everybody. Um, I posted some photos of an ocean piece that I did about, I guess about a week ago on my Facebook group and various other groups on Facebook that follow resin artists. And I got a lot of response um, very quickly that uh, not only did I get a lot of likes, um, on one side I had about 200 likes, but I also got a lot of questions uh, of how I actually created some of the effects that I had in that painting. Now, with resin art, it's very difficult to recreate the same piece twice. But I did recall very clearly uh, what I believed was the key components to that resin piece that created such realistic effects. So... This is going to be a painting that I did on, I guess, Friday night um, in my studio. And the canvas is a wooden canvas and it measures 36 by 12 inches. Um, it's not a, a typical artist canvas that you buy in the store, such as Michael's. It is a wooden canvas and that's very key. I have seen some resin artists get great effects on a regular canvas that's been gessoed, but I personally have not been very pleased with some of the uh, kind of final pieces of the canvas. Um, it's very difficult with the weight of the resin and the way that it behaves for it not to uh, kind of pull in towards the middle and kind of pull away from the sides. So. I'm going to talk you through this piece that I'm creating here and I'm going to be using a lot of products tonight um, and that's because resin art is very reliant on layering and um, so a lot of these blues that you're seeing me put down and I'm going to go through what they are in a second they are all very different viscosities and that's because they're all different products they're all being mixed into clear resin. But because I'm mixing, for instance, acrylic paint, mica powder, acrylic ink, alcohol ink, uh, it will actually ultimately behave quite differently. So the first blue that I put down, which is the very dark blue, is a golden fluid acrylic and... All of my products are going to be in the description below, so um, I hope I can pronounce this one. This is kind of an interesting word. It's Anthraquinone Blue, uh, A-N-T-H-R-A-Q-U-I-N-O-N-E, Blue. And it's a, very, um, it's a very beautiful blue, actually, and it has a semi-light, uh, fast kind of translucency to it. And that's the very dark blue that I've put on each end. The second blue that uh, I put down is another golden fluid acrylic. This is actually a high flow acrylic. And this is the teal that you can see down. Uh, and that is a golden acrylic, I said. And the color is teal. The uh, rich royal blue which incidentally I may be putting down right now. Let's see what I'm doing. No, this, this again is the uh, Amphroquinone blue, the really rich blue that's uh, towards the end there is a mica powder and it's by Black Diamond Pigment Powder and it's called Caribbean Blue. And that's a very rich blue. That's one of two mica powders that I'm gonna be using in this piece. The second mica powder is called Deep Blue Sea, and again, that's by Black Diamond Pigment Powder. I purchased those uh, mica powders on Amazon. Um, I'm not sure where else you can actually get that product, but I find that Amazon is where I go for that product. And again, every uh, paint and product that I'll be using this evening is available from Amazon and the uh, links are in my description. So what I'm doing right now is I've taken the two dark blues and I've put them at each end of the canvas and I've offset them into the corner. 
um, because I really want to kind of, um, I want to have some movement in this piece. So I've not kind of gone laterally straight across the canvas, the wooden canvas, because that creates a very uniform look. And that's not what I'm going for. Um, this is one of a collection that I've done using this size wooden uh, canvas. It Somehow it just seems to really make this type of painting very attractive. So what I'm doing right now is I'm essentially putting down all my blues. And I'm starting at both ends very dark. And I'm transitioning to more lighter blues as I come to the middle of the canvas. And the blue that I'm putting down right now is an Amsterdam acrylic ink. And uh, that is called turquoise blue. So right now I have golden fluid acrylic paint, Amsterdam acrylic ink, mica powder, and high flow acrylic paint. And when you put those down and you layer them, they start to interact. And that's what gives you the really interesting effects. Now, the paint that I'm putting down right now, it looks like I'm putting white down. But I'm actually not putting white down. I'm putting a golden interference paint. And it's called CT Interference Green Blue by Golden. I've got it on the screen right now. And if you're not familiar with interference paints, they have a color flip. They're um, opalescent color. They complement whether they're moving close to dark or lighter surfaces. And the color, depending on the colors around it, will actually flip. So it's kind of interesting. Um, I'm quite new to using interference paints. I've used them a couple of times in my pieces and um, I don't profess to be an expert, but I found that if I use an interference paint that's um, close to the colors in that it interacts with the colors on the piece, well, this one is green blue interference paint, it actually creates some pretty subtle effects within the actual piece. So right now, um, I have a lot of base color onto my canvas. Um, I'm lightly torching because resin, when you first put it down, is not really in its fluid state yet, um, unless you are in a very warm climate. If you're in a very warm climate, um, it can be very fluid very quickly but I'm based in North Carolina and uh, my, my studio right now is really sitting at a perfect temperature of about 68. And that's a great temperature to pour resin in. Not that higher temperatures don't work, but it means that I have a more of a longer life of the uh, resin. So I've, I've just lightly heated it. Um, and what I'm going to do right now is... Um, I'm going to start covering my canvas lightly to get good coverage. And if you've seen my previous video, uh, I referenced this, everybody has their own technique. And resin is, um, when you're first developing your technique, you, you'll come to realize what works for you. I have a tapping motion. Um, I, when I'm making coverage of my piece, so I'm trying to spread out these paints and uh, make sure that all of the board is essentially covered. I found if I tap, although I get color transition, I don't get blending of the colors so much. Um, obviously, if I tap a lot, I can get a lot of blending of the colors, but by by tapping in this motion and just making sure that all the canvas is covered, um, the colors are staying somewhat defined in themselves. However, I do want some combining. And the reason why I want combining is if you think of resin as the, the base of your pore, what you add to it is the solute. 
And depending on the solute that you choose, it will interact with the solutes around it. So, for instance, if I mix acrylic paint with resin, the solid, the, the um, base, and then I mix spray paint with resin, and then I put the two on the canvas with some overlap, they will naturally interact and create effects. So right now I'm just making sure that I have good coverage and I'm putting down a base design um, in my mind of how I want the piece to, the movement, um, the design, um, and just kind of creating a, Kind of a feel for what the finished piece will be. I'm putting down a little bit more of the deep blue, which is the golden amphiquinone blue. I'm putting a little bit more down of that. Um, one of the beauties of resin art is that you can continue to overlap your colors. If you want subtle effects, then overlap them with very fine uh, layering. But if you want a certain color to be dominant, then just put down a little bit more um, application of that color. And I'll show you that in a moment because I'm very fond of uh, the Black Diamond Pigment Caribbean Blue. And um, when I put that down in a minute, you'll see that I move just a tad slower as I put it on the piece. And that's because um, I, I want to be able to see it. I want the finished product to have that, that kind of characteristic of that product. So I keep layering my colors. And, you know, I mean, it's not a finished product right now. But if you, if you look at it, you can see the richness of the colors that I'm putting down. And again, there's no white on this piece at all right now. Um, the interference green blue, which is a kind of an opal finish, um, is there, you can see it kind of in the middle, kind of trying to um, make its presence known. A lot of uh, the solutes that are within the resin that I'm putting down will truly not show their true characteristics until I apply heat. Heat is a big key in resin art. Another key um, point I like to make is uh, for those of you that are used to doing um, acrylic pours with pouring medium, working with resin is, is really quite different. Um, and when you mix your colors into resin, there is a 90% resin rule. And what that means is that when you look at your mixture, 90% of the volume has to be resin. If you try to decrease that by um, adding more of the um, solute, be it paint, ink, mica powder, etc., what will happen is it will become very gel-like very quickly, and you may not even be able to use it. Now, it's interesting because I've just put down some more of the uh, deep sea blue, the deep, actually it says deep blue sea, if I'm being absolute. Uh, I've just put down more of that, and I actually put down a thicker line, if you look. And that's because I definitely want to keep that as a characteristic within my piece. Now, what I'm doing here is I am liberally applying clear resin. So when you mix your piece, you mix all your colors, you don't need much clear resin, um, but you need to leave just, you know, um, a little bit in a cup 
because clear resin creates great effects itself. It creates it creates a barrier between two products or three products, maybe five products that you've put down. Um, and when it's actually torched and heated up, it actually really increases the um, the way that the solutes work. Some will move through it and they will want to be at the top and some will fall through it and want to be at the bottom. So clear resin is a great tool to use in resin art. Now this is the first time I've applied white. This is titanium white by Golden Acrylics. And I'll mention this um, quickly. I, I see a lot of blogging where um, people are saying, well, golden acrylic paints are very expensive. Um, when you go into the uh, craft store and you look at the little containers and it's got a pretty interesting price tag attached to them, just remember this. They, are, they have an incredibly um, dense pigment. So you actually use very little in the resin. So when it comes to uh, golden fluid acrylics, I'm probably adding about 4% of the volume to the resin to create the effects. It is that dense in pigment. Um, the white has gone down. Now, this is the key to how I created those shimmery waves on my other piece. This is a Rust-Oleum metallic silver paint. And I am spraying it straight onto wet resin. The, and my design is not there yet. I have a base shape. I know how it's going to flow. But I have actually not moved it around a great deal to create any effects. And I've liberally sprayed the metallic Rust-Oleum um, silver paint onto it. Straight away, I'm coming behind that with my spray bottle. My spray bottle contains 91% alcohol. The, such, the type of alcohol you can buy in the pharmacy department of um, your local store. Now, if you look at the kind of the middle where the teal color is, you'll see some holes like dots. That's the, um, that's the alcohol. I don't fully understand how alcohol works. I just know it's integral to some of the effects that you um, can create in your resin art. What it does is it, it makes contact with the color and disperses it. It almost breaks it down. And, um, and that creates some of the effects. Now, when I mixed the white into that um, resin, I did actually add a little bit of alcohol, a few drips into the cup also, just to change the viscosity. So now, this is where the fun begins. So I am using my heat gun, um, and I am heating and I am moving the resin. So the heat comes in contact with the resin. The resin starts to take on a very fluid consistency. The viscosity is thinning, um, and that enables me to start moving um, the products around. And there's been a lot of layering of color here. And you and the shimmer of the silver on the top is the spray paint. Um, so I don't fear spraying it straight on top of my resin because I know I'm going to be able to move it around and manipulate it once it's down. And what I'm doing here is applying some heat and then I'm guiding it and starting to move it like the ocean would move. Another technique if you don't have a hot um, a heat gun is if you do have a blowtorch or um, some people in their kitchen have a like a little kind of blowtorch they use for like creme brulee etc you can use that by all means. The problem is when you add the heat it will the resin will take on a fluid consistency, but it won't move. Okay, so 
In that way, if you want to create effects, you would have to lift your canvas and tilt it. Very similar to what you see um, the fluid acrylic artists do, where they, they tilt, um, they maybe they do a puddle pull, uh, pour and then they lift the canvas and they tilt it and the and the fluid starts to move around and we get some great effects that is an option with resin art too but you have to heat the resin because when the resin first gets applied to the canvas the wooden panel as I use it's it's not really in a runny state it's in a liquid state but um it's not going to move around freely. Once you apply the torch to it and you warm it, it has a very fluid um, kind of viscosity. The other thing I should mention is, and this is probably one of the toughest aspects of resin art in comparison to fluid pouring, is resin has technically a very short life cycle. Now, there is some, there's a lot of different resin products on the market, without a doubt, and some of them will uh, profess to having a workability time of about 45 minutes. Um, I, I don't, you know, on the whole, I have to say that I kind of, I believe that it's really in its fluid state and at its best and at its most manipulatable um, for about 20, 25 minutes. And um, so that's one of the um, big differences to fluid pouring acrylic, which may have a life cycle, you know, until it dries, etc. It changes, right? Whereas resin goes down as a liquid, you apply heat, the viscosity starts to thin, it becomes very fluid. That's how you create your effects. But the life cycle is ticking in the background. You've got 20 minutes and you have to get to a point where you feel pretty happy. Now, when you leave your piece alone, it's a little bit like an acrylic pour in that some of the effects will continue to evolve. But really, a lot of the work has already happened. So this is kind of interesting because obviously... I've dispersed out um, a lot of the colors. And when, when, I, um, when I finish, I will show some close-ups. These, uh, when you look at this piece, um, and I'm just spraying some more 91% alcohol because I want to make sure I've dispersed out the silver spray paint um, and created some interesting effects. Um, when you look at the, the finished item, it has many layers within it. So this is one layer of resin, technically. But because you've used, or I've used, I've used acrylic paint, high flow acrylic paint, acrylic ink, mica powder, and clear resin, and spray paint. All of those products are different. They all have different weight attached to them. Some will sink, some will rise. Spray paint typically comes to the top. Um, so some will rise and some will sink. And they will battle against each other to be more dominant. Um, and so when you see the close-ups... Resin art, without a doubt, is incredibly beautiful if you create the right kind of colors and you use the right kind of solutes, which is your products. So you want them to butt up against each other. You want to layer them. You want them to interact on your piece. Now, resin... Um, it's going to now take 8 to 12 hours to cure to a point of being able to manipulate it as far as pick it up, maybe photograph the piece. But you really can't touch it for 8 to 12 hours. I would say 12 hours. I typically um, put it under cover for about 12 hours. 
and protect it from dust so that it cures with a really beautiful finish. And I also um, finish my pieces by uh, applying a clear top coat of resin so that it really is protected. So guys, I'm going to take you in for a close-up. Um, you have to excuse my, my abilities to move my camera around too well. Um, but as you can see, there's some interesting effects going on here. This really does feel kind of like the waves and the ocean. And look at that, that Rust-Oleum uh, spray paint. The 91% alcohol has broken it down. Look at the teal blue shining through. Absolutely gorgeous. The 91% alcohol is broken down, is moved around, is dispersed. And the colors within underneath are coming through and they're layering against each other. So the richness is just absolutely gorgeous. And that teal color is the golden uh, fluid acrylic teal. One of my absolute favorites. Sorry about the angle, guys. It's not always easy to set my camera up. Thanks. Thank you for viewing. And um, I hope you enjoyed seeing this piece being created. And I hope you feel very uh, interested in maybe uh, dabbling in resin art. And have a great weekend, guys. Bye.